Okay, so what is our what is as a developer your wish as a for doing your job? I want to deliver desired functionality in a sustainable and timely manager man, manner. I don't want to burn myself out doing it, but I want to keep a regular flow. And why do you want to do it? Well, I don't want to get credit for my work, and I want a good bonus. So ask ask the BDD genie for help. I don't think he's in his uh, taboo list, but uh, he might be able to help you out. So he replies, oh, you want to get it right first time. And you want to deliver what the customer is expecting, but more importantly, when they want to get it. So where does that take you? Well, in order to achieve that, and that's just covered a bit on testing, and um, this is more on testing, you've got to put validation first. And this isn't verification, this is validation, which means show that what was delivered is what the customer was actually expecting. And if you don't, all you do is severely annoy your customers, which could be both monetary or bad press, which is also monetary, but not quantifiable. But you've also wasted your own time and your own money in doing something which wasn't required or not actually wanted. A lot of projects I've seen over the years, I've been mean, in this job and I've been in this job for about 30 odd years, uh, projects have failed because they fail to do what the end user wants and they end up stop using it or trying to do a workaround. Uh, also learned that when doing business process re-engineering work at another company. To do validation first, you have to understand what is the problem, which means you need to know the truth. And as Colonel Nathan Jessup from the film uh, A Few... Fugerman, uh, said, what is the truth? The truth is making sure that you deliver the right thing because um, you need the common understanding, both the developers and the stakeholders. And if you don't know what you're delivering, how the heck do you estimate it? How do you know how complex it is? And then how do you honor a commitment on delivering it on time? Now, we've all seen government projects which are massively overspent and overrunning budget or overrunning time because they don't know what they're delivering and they just run this massive black hole of risk. So with behavior-driven development, the first thing you've got to do is define the goals and the intent of what the end user wants. And that's a three-part statement. Who, the role, wants what, and why? Now I've done system engineering in the past, working on uh, cellular uh, network optimization tools. And when I spoke to the system engineers, the field engineers, they said they wanted this, that, and the other. But then they kept saying, I went into kid mode. Why? Why? And why again? Until they couldn't stop giving me an answer. Because when you're doing requirements, not many people can actually elicitate what they want. They think they know what they want, but it may not be what they actually want. Until you actually understand the rationale and what they are trying to achieve is when you can actually really start talking about the what they actually need to do their job to actually fulfill the goal. Now, when was the last time you saw a BDD statement? Hopefully, you'll say about two minutes ago on the opening slide, which is, as a developer, I want to blah, 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 so that I get credit and a good bonus on my pay rise. So that is the first declaration of goals. And these are just stacked up in a backlog item and you can start working on them. But these are quite low level. You know, if we're talking to an enterprise uh, system, where do you start? Um, my last employer produced core banking software for several top tier banks. And we were dealing with chief finance officers and marketing officers and all sorts of people. So BDD actually can be put into a hierarchical decomposition. So we start off with a business vision. And we want the e banking software that we're doing to be the provider of choice for SME, which is in this case, not subject matter expert, but a small medium enterprise. 
So that's the overall business goal, enterprise goal. We can then start putting it into more context. So our business vision, you know, so our business goal, the performance vision, is we want to increase our SME retention on the e-banking website. So we don't want to go to our competitors on, uh, in another organization. We want to retain them and make e-banking easier. And then we start talking about uh, agile mentality of epics, features, and the backlog items, getting onto the real nitty gritty features that we're going to start delivering. So we can say, as the SME, so we're putting into the context of the end user now, I want self-serving capabilities for my banking needs. That can be split down into a number of features. And then we get into the backlog items themselves. Now, it's these bottom backlog items, which are the ones which are time boxed. And these are what we aim to deliver within an agile sprint window, for example, whether it be two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, whatever the business is decreed and also the teams have been doing. The only thing above it can span, can span multiple sprints. So that's a, a banking example. Going into just starting the Epic level, here's an example I actually worked on, which was we were doing, a, I was working on a project which was cross-platform development, and we were working with being able to plug into the customer's database engine of choice which was either Oracle, Postgres, Microsoft. And at one point, it was a, a, a Apache Ignite as well. And we needed a way where we could specify queries, but not having to redevelop them by hand uh, into the different languages, for example, Microsoft TSQL or Oracle SQL, Postgres SQL. Uh, and have these, this translation mechanism so we only had to test a translator once and be able to port over to these other languages. And we decided, okay, we'll write our standard set of queries in anti-SQL and have a translator to go across to the ones. We also wanted some other things. And a spin-off from this, which I put into my own little project, was a post that I saw on Twitter from um, Purple Frog, Alex Whittle, where he said he wanted to start looking at SQL statements and seeing what tables and what columns from which tables were used and how how many tables were referenced in a query. So I started to look at putting some uh, uh, features in there. And I started to turn this into a reusable DLL, which I ended up putting in my own little test harness as a Azure function. So I actually made a little API system on a REST API function on Azure functions and be able to send my code up as a the message body and got the, tra the translation of the analytical back. So we've specified the scope uh, and the goal and the intent of what we wanted. But now that's fine, but what does this thing actually do? We've got to specify the behavior. You know, this is behavior driven development. So what is the behavior? We know the goal, but what's the guts of the thing doing? Well. We can take a, a look back to Sir Isaac Newton and the Apple. Hang on. Wasn't Babbage one of the founders of the computer com calculation engine? What's Newton got to do with it? Well, source code is the most specific or the ha most specific description of behavior that can be used by a computer. Once we get to the level of source code, we didn't go any further. Yeah, but still, what's that got to do with Newton? Well, software, to me, follows Newton's law of motion in terms of an object will remain either at rest or in motion until acted on by an external force. Well, I'm not a, an apple which the stem breaks and I drop to earth under gravity, which is the external force. I'm a software system. Well, let's just look at it in a slightly different way. I have a nice little Alsatian there, sat down, panting, and happy as can be. It meets a proverbial boot, which results in a, a not so happy dog attacking the owner of the boot. Well, the event here is something that can happen in a computer system. You know, most computers sit in a, an event processing loop. 
They just sit there doing nothing until something occurs. And that event is a user input, a timer, an API call, an interrupt, something on a message queue coming in, but they're all variants of the same theme. So yeah, in a way, Newton was right. Software just sits there doing nothing until next step acted upon by an external force, an event. So we can start looking at this initial state, event, outcome. And BDD has a very nice way of defining this. It's called the acceptance criteria. Now, I was once worked in CMM level three as a requirements manager. And when we went through a, an audit for both CMM level three and TL9000, I had an auditor say, why do you write requirements and a test spec? He said, we have to, that's the process. He said, well, what's the difference between a requirement and a test spec? Uh, don't know. And the reply was, nothing. They give the same information. The only difference is, this, is the tense of the statement. So a requirement is usually future tense. It shall do something. The test spec is show that it did do something. So future tense, past tense. Well, why don't you just make them the same thing? And your requirement becomes your acceptance criteria, which is basically a statement of the format of given an initial state, when an event happens, then there's an observable outcome. As shown on the screen. So going back to the first slide I showed of validation is primary or paramount. Show what was delivered equals what was expected. In other words, it was the acceptance criteria, which has been agreed up front between development and stakeholders. So everybody has a common understanding and then you have got what you set out to do. So going back to my little uh, example of anti-translation. Here's an anti-select statement. When I translate it to Microsoft SQL, TSQL, I'll get a translation. And you can see the overlays are being translated into substring. And the last one turned out to be quite complex, but the translator did it and it, the code works. But the other thing you can handle is BDD across teams. Now, You've got a, a behavior for an end user. They don't care about the technology stack because nobody re should really buy technology. They buy the functionality that technology provides to help them do their job and make their own money. So in a technology team, you've got UX, middleware, and storage, just split down. The story covers the whole stack. But how do the teams talk to themselves? Well, they, each one has an interface, and they can define the interfaces between themselves and then build their own stories to match the interface. So the UX team is a consumer of the middleware, and the middleware is a consumer of the storage system. So we've covered the validation. What about verification? Because we've all heard of the waterfall model and V and V, verification and validation. Well, verification is show that what you have created is what you said you would do. But if you don't do it driven by validation, you can fall into the um void of proving that you've correctly delivered the wrong thing which is a, a lot of egg on your face and i have seen a cmm level five project do that because the end customers absolutely hated it but they did all the procedure they followed all the had all the stats in there all the requirements all the traceability but it wasn't usable So I'm going to show a quick example in the time we've got left on uh, using Visual Studio 19 um, BDD packages. And the first one we started off when Dan and I were working together with Story Q in .NET Framework. In .NET Core and .NET 5, you can use Speclight, which is the one I've been using recently. Or you can use Specflow, which people have asked me about at, at interviews. But I thought, oh, I don't know that one. I've only used Speclight. I need to learn Specflow. 
And the way I set my tests up, and I have been, don't shout at me for using MS test. I know that there are other flavors out there which are probably more popular. But I've made all my tests data driven. And I've set, and it uses a, a lot of reflection in the test. So the tests are very small. And I have a test data folder in all my projects, which has a subfolder of the name of the class of the test, my test class. Then inside there are subfolders for each test, and that's the method name of the test. And I use reflection to actually work out the data files. I have a generic runner, and I just call it the only run tests. And I also like it because the BDE statements, the method names, you can put underscores in there, and then it'll do parameter substitution when it prints out the results set, and it just uses a two string method on the parameters to get the text it will put in. One thing I have noticed that if you have lists and things like that, you might want to put your own class on there. So instead of using a generic list string, you put a, your own collection in there, my string test list um, derived from that, and put the two string method in there, which could just be something like uh, run adjacent serializer on it, just to print out the, the actual content so you actually see what it is. Otherwise, you just see the general name that a uh, debug would normally show. So this is uh, my anti-SQL uh, uh, utility test. And here is my test builder. So this is setting up the framework that I'm testing. And uh, it's just a, an immutable builder. So as a database engineer, I want to do this, so that. These are my test methods. And they just all call, call run test with the, the parameters. I try to avoid putting a lot of text in um, the test class itself, especially in embedded literal test. Because uh, in a previous project, way before I met Dan, I actually managed to blow up SQL Studio, uh, Visual Studio rather. The, there was so much text, literal text, it couldn't compile the file because of the way it actually exploded the literal text. The other thing is that if you're doing something like SQL or you're doing JSON or XML as literal text, it's hard to actually read because you have to escape characters all over the place. So what uh, I came up with the idea was by having this run test and this uh, test folder you see on the top right, we can now put our de test data and expected data, the source data and results data, in files and use the IDE to help format it. So it's nice and easy to read, nice and easy to quickly set up, and you can quickly copy it and move it between tests. The names are consistent, so you've got traceability. And then when you call it, I put in this little um, base test abstract class for all my tests, which contain all the reflection code. So I can actually get a resource as a string. I put stuff in there where I can get a resource as a, an array of lines or just a one text blob. I can read it if I know it's JSON. And it works on the way of getting the assembly and then working out where things are, and these these resources are all embedded, just for speed. And then I put my uh, test in place for my uh, feature. So it's create a feature spec, which uses the builder, my given statement, and these are um, just the method functions. So it's uh, an anti-SQL clause is a method just to load it in using the anti-SQL uh, content from the file of anti-dot text when something happens. And what these methods are actually doing, the, the actioners and the result checkers, are loading member uh, variable, member properties of the test class, which can then be reused across the uh, different methods and then execute. So with that statement, that one little piece of code, we get a result spec. And if you followed what we've done so far of setting your declaration, your goal, your intent, and your acceptance criteria, this becomes a direct comparison to your result set for showing that you've done what you said you would do. And you've actually validated your code upfront and the whole thing's been driven by validation and satisfying the needs of the customer. And that is the essence of BDD, satisfying the needs of the customer without giving yourself an injury in the process. And with that, 
Uh, I think I've just about used up my time. There's a lot to talk about. BDD is a lot more complicated than this in, in, in terms of the uh, depth that you can go to it in nth degree. I've been doing it now for seven years. And with that, I think my time is up and I'll hand over to the next person who I've forgotten who it is.